we certainly welcome Dan uh, and Chris. And thank you so much for your um, uh, your wonderful setup, which is a lot to look at. So uh, welcome Dan Logan. Well, thank you all for uh, coming. And um, I'm going to uh, give you, uh, there's probably not going to be quite enough, so if uh, uh, families can uh, share one, it's uh, some uh, dates in uh, the civil rights history and then uh, some quiz questions on the back to kind of challenge yourself if uh, you can remember names and events uh, that might represent the, uh, the topic of the day. So. This uh, presentation will be in part uh, reflections on uh, why uh, I and a friend of mine chose to uh, leave our comfort zone and uh, uh, go to a very unfamiliar place in uh, Mississippi. And in part, this will uh, be telling you about what Freedom Summer uh, was intended to accomplish, and we have some uh, clips from a uh, PBS uh, that was uh, done uh, about 18 months ago to reflect that event uh, 50 years ago. So I'm trying to put my head into where it was when I was 20, which is <laughs> a while back. <laughs> so. I want to save a, a, a few minutes at the end for uh, questions and conversations. Uh, Andrew will be uh, taping this, but uh, I hope this won't serve as any uh, inhibition to uh, your uh, uh, having uh, questions and so on. Uh, you are certainly welcome to uh, ask questions uh, if you uh, want to. But uh, please, when you have a question, if you'll uh, give us uh, your name, uh, since I can't see faces, uh, that'll, that'll help to uh, kind of place uh, who you are. And um, so if there are folks who have spent any part of their lives in Mississippi, anybody, just wave your hand or whatever. Um, Help, help keep me honest and accurate. Uh, my information about uh, Mississippi is really quite dated, and I sure do hope that things have changed a whole lot. So you'll see uh, behind me uh, books and uh, uh, DVD of that period, and I am certainly willing to lend these. They are far more valuable in uh, uh, your uh, hands for uh, a few weeks than sitting uh, on my shelf. So please uh, use the clipboard and let us know which one you might want to borrow. So the influences on me uh, could be summarized as events of the period, uh, uh, religion, and my uh, American history classes. So we'll begin when I was 13 in 1957 in Little Rock, Arkansas, when nine black students attempted to enroll in Little Rock High School. And the town folk uh, arose in opposition, and Governor Orville Faubus uh, uh, stood in the classroom door, so to speak. And uh, so I saw him on TV, and I wrote a one-page paper for my eighth grade social studies class quoting this governor. I could not understand the unfairness of segregating children on the basis of skin color, and uh, to me, uh, his remarks uh, struck me as ignorant. Uh, then, in 1962, just as I was entering uh, Stanford, uh, James Meredith, a, a high achiever, was wanting to transfer to the University of Mississippi to be the first uh, black student uh, enrolled. And again, 
the students and the town folk and many from distant places came to Oxford, Mississippi and a riot erupted uh, on national TV for three days, uh, completely out of control and uh, Governor Ross Barnett refused to uh, bring in Mississippi uh, law enforcement, uh, leaving it to the Kennedy administration to bring in federal marshals so that the court desegregation order could be uh, carried out. Uh, as for religion, I was uh, taking classes at Stanford taught by Dr. Robert McAfee Brown, who was known for uh, his uh, conscientious objector status during World War II. And he had us reading uh, theologians, Karl Barth, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, Reinhold Niebuhr, and Martin Luther King. Uh, Christianity was moving much uh, toward uh, faith in action and understanding uh, social gospel. These were the years of the Second Vatican Council in Rome under the guidance of Pope John the 23rd. Uh, the Catholic Church was uh, moving toward change and for the first time in the 400 years since the Reformation, Protestants and Catholics were finally talking to each other. <laughs> and uh, if, uh, to, to understand the influence of uh, John 23, uh, think only of Pope uh, Francis. Uh, the same rock star status, the same charisma and motivation was uh, uh, not only uh, influencing and motivating uh, Catholics, but uh, Christians and non-Christians alike. My own religious awareness was beginning to change as I would attend national conferences of my denomination, the American Baptist Student Movement, and uh, suddenly discovering that the church was active in civil rights and issues of war and peace uh, matters that were quite unfamiliar to my congregation in Salinas. I was fascinated in my American history uh, classes to learn about the unique history and mores of the states of the old confederacy. Uh, Professor David Potter was uh, lecturing on how uh, Jim Crow laws uh, and customs uh, prevented uh, African American population from uh, being able to participate and enjoy the privileges of just ordinary citizenship. Mississippi was clearly the most extreme example of this. The poorest state, the highest pop, uh, percentage of, of uh, black citizens, and only 6.7% of blacks uh, were registered voters. Uh, professor James Silver, uh, professor of history at Old Miss for 30 years. He knew his subject well and published a book in 1964, Mississippi, The Closed Society. I was reading that book as I was preparing uh, to go to uh, Mississippi. Uh, after uh, Silver had gone public, life for him changed. He, he and his family were at, at risk and uh, he uh, ended up uh, having to depart from uh, his uh, home uh, state and uh, finished his career teaching at uh, Notre Dame. Wrote a book called Running Scared, Silver in Mississippi. It's fascinating reading. During my sophomore year at, at Stanford, Martin Luther King came to campus and spoke to a packed auditorium about uh, the uh, Montgomery boycott, uh, bus boycott, and how nonviolence can uh, uh, succeed and was uh, working to get a stronger Civil Rights Act passed. 
And then a few weeks after that, and this, uh, remember, was just after the Kennedy assassination, uh, Bob Moses came to campus. Uh, Moses was the one who had conceived the idea of uh, uh, Freedom Summer and was on a recruiting uh, tour to uh, get a thousand uh, students from across the country to commit to, uh, to coming. So now let's hear the first two clips and uh, you'll get an idea of both black and white Mississippians uh, on Freedom Summer. There are a lot of phonies who will stand up and tell you that, oh, well, all are equal in the eyes of God. How silly can you get? Christ himself was the greatest teacher of segregation. Mississippi really stood like an island of resistance. There were only 6.7% of blacks were registered to vote prior to Freedom Summer, compared to 50, 60, or 70% in other southern states. Most of the rest of America didn't seem to care, and that's what Freedom Summer was about. If we bring white students and black students from all over the country, then everyone will pay attention to Mississippi. We'll bring America to Mississippi, because America is not paying attention to Mississippi. In the 50s and 60s, particularly in the old plantation agricultural areas of the state, African Americans made up at least half, and in some cases, 70 or 80 percent of the population. And in some counties, of course, there was a realistic understanding that uh, if black people voted, they probably would be electing black officials. A lot of white people thought that African Americans in the South would literally take over and white people would have to move. They would have to get out of the state. I was born in Mississippi, and I'm the product of the society in which I was raised. And I have a vested interest in that society, and I, along with a million other white Mississippians, will do everything in our power to protect that vested interest. There was no Ku Klux Klan in Mississippi during this early period. There wasn't any need for one. The Citizens Council was doing everything that the Ku Klux Klan would have done. There were a lot of prominent people who were members, businessmen, bankers, lawyers, politicians. I joined it because I believed in what they were doing and I believed in trying to preserve the society in which we live. This is the Citizens Council Forum, the American viewpoint with a Southern accent. The Citizens Council was really running the state of Mississippi. It was part of the whole apparatus of, of a white supremacist society, that you had the local police, you had the registrar, you had everyone involved in uh, the Citizens Council. They succeeded in preventing almost all blacks who attempted to register from registering to vote. Political participation was something reserved for whites. And if blacks sought it, they could get hurt in lots of different ways, ranging from economic reprisals, loss of jobs, or if you had a business, uh, uh, restrictions or being placed on your business, or if you had a loan, your loan being called in. The common theory about Mississippi was that you could not attack Mississippi from the inside. It had to be attacked from the outside. You had to stand away and say, this is an awful place and it ought to fix itself. But Bob Moses and the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee said, no, that's not true. We can do it ourselves. Bob Moses was a high school teacher in New York City. He went south in 1960, originally just feeling he had to go, had to get involved. SNCC sent him to Mississippi. He started going around on his own in the rural areas where people simply didn't go and challenge the status quo. What made him stand out was not only his sheer courage, but his calm courage. 
I can't tell you that Bob Moses was afraid because he never showed it. <laughs> he just went about his work and there was this, this calm sense of mission. Bob went over there by himself in 1961. And by the end of 61, maybe there were five or six NIC people in the state. In 62, maybe there were 18, 19. And in 63, maybe there was 23, 24. When we'd have a staff meeting, we all fit in one little room. The young people working with the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, or SNCC as we call it, are characterized by a restless energy. They seek radical change in race relations in the United States. Their world is upset, and they feel that if they are ever going to get it straight, they must upset it more. I don't want anybody to think that we were a bunch of really brave Negroes <laughs> running around Mississippi. That's not what we were. The reason that SNCC, as it were, opened up the Delta is we were young and foolish. We didn't have the, under the, the very complete understanding of what that risk was. We will treat anyone with great respect here in Mississippi, anyone who comes here, as long as they do not disobey our laws. But we will treat the people who come here, these children, like any other backward children. Go Mississippi, keep rolling along. Go Mississippi, you cannot be wrong. They're outsiders coming down here trying to change the world, and, and there's natural resentment. I mean, that's common sense. M-I-S, S-I-S, S-I-S. We didn't think those people understood uh, what kind of society we had here. Uh, you know, these college students would sit up there at Oberlin and there'd be an articulate, uh, well-groomed black person sitting next to them, and they assumed all blacks were like that, and they weren't. They're coming for the purpose of registering blacks to vote, and since this state had the highest percentage of blacks of any state in the United States, that posed a real threat politically. There was a siege mentality, us against them, and I hated them. Your song, M-I-S, S-I-S, S-I-P-P-I. Let me state as clearly as I can what the mindset of the state of Mississippi was, encouraged and emboldened by the utterances of its politicians. If the white people of Mississippi will just stay together, will just stick together, there is no force in this country that will cause segregation to be ended. That was the mindset. We face absolute extinction of all we hold dear unless we are victorious. We can win. My friends, if we are organized in every community in Mississippi and all over this nation of ours, we must be stronger than the enemy. We must be strong enough to crush the enemy. They're caught in a circle which if there are people who want to break out, they don't know how. They don't have a chance. They, they just... White people are probably more oppressed or in terms of their ability to speak than Negroes. Well, <clears throat> with uh, some of this information available to us, uh, without much hesitation, uh, a friend of mine and I uh, signed up to uh, be uh, civil rights uh, volunteers. Um, so we were told uh, that we would be responsible for getting to the state, responsible for our own expenses. We'd have to raise some money. Um, that uh, the project would arrange for housing for us and uh, some of our meals while we were there. We were expected to understand 
and commit to a code of conduct that included nonviolence. We learned about the risks to our uh, personal safety. We'd be viewed as outsiders. We'd be expected to behave as representatives of the organizations. Now, uh, so we talk about preparing to go, but keep in mind that what we were doing uh, in uh, my hometown of Salinas was going on in the homes and communities of all of these 700 people from uh, all over the, uh, the, the nation. So my parents were devout Christians, uh, but religiously motivated social action was not part of their background. And we had some interesting conversations uh, about how important this had become to me. Um, I have a, a, a handout here uh, that might be of interest to uh, young adults uh, uh, because there are issues uh, today that might cause people to uh, leave their comfort zones uh, uh, just as we did. You might even think of uh, Ferguson is uh, t kind of an example of today of some of the challenges that uh, we still face uh, and will always face, really. Uh, my parents were certainly very concerned about my personal safety, particularly when uh, three of the uh, uh, volunteers disappeared during the first week of the project. I learned much later that my dad had gone out and bought a couple of life insurance policies. <laughs> So since we did have to raise some money, uh, I uh, was able to get uh, an interview on uh, KSBW uh, TV since I'd uh, been an employee there several years earlier. And we got uh, a uh, uh, article, two articles in the Salinas, Californian. And I would hope that with that publicity, some checks would start coming in. Well, it didn't work like that. <laughs> uh, we had to go talk to people more directly, and uh, that uh, helped somewhat. My dad uh, got me a chance to speak to the uh, uh, Kiwanis Club, and a few folks uh, stepped forward and, and did help us. Uh, so uh, I uh, got an opportunity to uh, speak at the uh, Sunday evening uh, service at uh, my uh, church, the uh, First Baptist of Salinas, where there was a hundred people there that night, most of whom had watched uh, little Danny Logan grow up from infancy to uh, now this uh, know-it-all college student. And uh, uh, so I, I used as my biblical text the, the words of Jesus, and as much as you've done it to the least of these, my brothers, you've done it to me. And uh, I explained from uh, what uh, these uh, people had been uh, teaching me as Sunday school teachers, as youth leaders, uh, and just good uh, uh, examples of Christian kindness and teaching of fairness and that uh, all of us are God's children and that uh, I learned those lessons and I was ready to uh, go out and uh, try to put those in, into practice. So now we're ready to uh, be on our way. And uh, so uh, we quit our jobs as uh, YMCA uh, uh, day camp leaders and uh, headed off in the, in the heat of summer. Now, our roles in this project were, were relatively uh, minor. Uh, but the uh, impact of this project have uh, remained, in my mind, one of the most uh, uh, memorable lifetime uh, achievements. We drove across the desert in uh, midsummer, uh, slept out under the stars beside our uh, little uh, MG that Richard had, no air conditioning. We drove the whole way with the top down. <laughs> and, so uh, despite these uh, three missing uh, civil rights workers, uh, uh, there were uh, 700 of us that were selected to participate. The sponsoring organizations included the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, 
uh, the uh, Southern Christian Leadership Conference and the uh, NAACP that I think most of us are familiar with. So uh, before we could uh, be dispatched out to uh, the uh, state, uh, everyone was required to participate in uh, training and mine was held at Tougaloo a Christian College, a uh, campus just outside of Jackson, Mississippi, where we were taught uh, how to avoid getting caught in the clutches of the KKK, which by then was very active. And even uh, sheriffs in the rural counties were really no different than the KKK. Um, anytime we were going to make a trip out of uh, Jackson, we first of all had to phone in, give a detailed uh, description of where we were going, when we were expected to arrive, and then uh, as soon as we arrived at our destination, again, we had to make another phone call and confirm that we had arrived safely. And uh, that didn't always happen, and uh, a plan was put into action to find out what had, had happened on one of the workers' uh, uh, plans. Well, my first assignment uh, for Freedom Summer was right uh, there at uh, headquarters in uh, Jackson, where uh, I was made responsible for keeping the daily incident log updated. Uh, the who, what, when, and where of reports that were uh, telephoned in constantly of uh, maybe uh, a worker that had been uh, followed in their car uh, down a, uh, a rural road uh, or a church that had been burned after being used for uh, freedom uh, uh, schools. Uh, and so uh, after uh, we had all the incidents uh, compiled for a day, I'd get it typed up and then using an ancient mimeograph machine, we'd crank out copies and make sure everybody was kept up to date as to what was going on. My first Sunday in Jackson, I went to church at a Baptist church. It kind of seemed like all the churches were Baptist, whether black or uh, white. And the, the, the uh, pastor preached a sermon on the uh, Good Samaritan and as uh, I was uh, going out, I introduced myself, asked for an appointment. And uh, when I got there to see him, I introduced myself as a uh, civil rights worker and uh, was interested in uh, knowing what his congregation was uh, doing for the needs of their black uh, neighbors. And he uh, very proudly told me that he was on a committee to uh, rebuild a church that had burned down. And I said, well, that's great, but there are dozens of them being burned down this uh, summer. And uh, it, he didn't want to talk about that. Uh, what he really wanted to know was what the state of my soul was. And I assured him that my salvation had had from a very tender age. And then he wanted to talk about my friend's soul. And I, 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 I really found, well, if that's as far as I can get with a sem seemingly enlightened person, I, I guess I see what, what our challenge is here. Um, so our next assignment was to drive to the northern part of the state where we had the locations of uh, several buildings that had been uh, offered as a place for, uh, we, we had really thousands of books that had been donated and we needed to get them out to the distant parts of the state. And uh, we were uh, given the opportunity to stay overnight at the home of a black family and that was really a, a great opportunity uh, to get to see uh, how people uh, with very minimal resources were able to carry out their lives and we talked and sang until late at night until it was time to unroll our sleeping bags on the floor. Um, so voter registration, uh, well no, I guess what I wanted to say first was that the, uh, the, the uh, freedom schools 
uh, was uh, a, a major uh, assignment. Uh, and uh, so we have a clip uh, here that will uh, give you some idea of how the Freedom Schools operate. One of the most wonderful things about 1964 Mississippi summer were the Freedom Schools. The state of Mississippi deliberately and systematically kept black people uneducated and ignorant and then turned around and made education a requirement in order to participate in the political process. We were able to do the Freedom Schools in the summer of 1964 because we had almost a thousand students coming to the state of Mississippi, thus the human resources to actually, you know, conduct classes. We hope to find and develop and mold local leadership among the young people. We also hope to promote a better self-image among the local Negroes. We would send out mass uh, flyers and, and everything to the churches, uh, telling people about the Freedom School, what the Freedom School was going to entail, uh, the courses, uh, the activities. We got the preachers involved, we got the kids involved. Black people couldn't go to the library. It was for whites only. And so here they are, got their own library now. They would come excited to be exposed to the teaching and to browse the books. In the public schools where I was in school, I had never heard of Dr. Seuss. It was at Freedom School where we actually not only read the story of the cat in the hat, but we acted it out. Having our lives enriched by these activities really made a huge difference in my life. We taught um, African American history, civics, African culture, African dance. They were learning uh, black history. So uh, along with uh, uh, Freedom Schools, the other major activity during the summer was uh, voter registration. Now, we knew that we couldn't actually get uh, these thousands of uh, people who wanted to vote. We were not going to be able to get them through these uh, local county uh, voter registrars with these rigged uh, literacy uh, uh, tests and the intimidation that uh, you've heard about already. Uh, so what we did was using the Mississippi registration forms and uh, role-playing what it was like to go to that county registrar, we, we were able to register thousands of people in each of the uh, uh, counties so that then they would go to a county convention, just like the regular uh, 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 and, and, and in, in Mississippi, there really was only one party. It was an all-white uh, uh, Democratic uh, Party. So uh, we created the Freedom Democratic Party. And so they would go to their county and hold a convention, select delegates that, that then went to the state uh, party convention and conducted it in parallel fashion and elected delegates to the National Democratic Convention that was being held in Atlantic City that year. And the goal was to send a biracial delegation and uh, ask the Credentials Committee to seat this uh, 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 delegation rather than the all-white uh, uh, delegation. And it was amazing the kind of support that uh, this uh, uh, garnered among uh, people uh, from uh, uh, going to that national uh, convention. And um, uh, so the, the goal was 
to uh, show that, uh, that our delegates uh, more truly reflected the goals of the Democratic uh, uh, Party. Uh, so we're not going to have time to tell you the whole story of how that worked, but uh, I wanted you to uh, see a, a clip of uh, uh, Lyndon Johnson's uh, interesting press conference in which he is attempting to keep uh, Fannie Lou Hamer uh, from uh, appearing on national uh, TV. And you'll see what an amazing uh, person uh, she is, an authentic voice of uh, 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 rural uh, uh, Tennessee. The sharecropper who had been evicted from her plantation had come to symbolize the Mississippi movement. Mr. Chairman, and to the Credentials Committee, it was the 31st of August in 1962 that 18 of us traveled 26 miles to the county courthouse in Indianola to try to register to become first-class citizens. We was met in Indianola with by policemen. The president, Lyndon Johnson, he's not afraid of Martin Luther King's testimony. He's afraid of Fannie Lou Hamer's testimony. And so he decides that the country should not see her testify live. Johnson is in the White House, and he convened an impromptu press conference. We will return to this scene in Atlantic City, but now we switch to the White House and NBC's Robert Gorelsky. Now, ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States. On this day, nine months ago. He did it knowing that they would break away, thinking he might announce who his choice of vice president was going to be. Instead, he gets up there and he announces, get this, he announces that it's nine months to the day since, since Governor Connolly, who was there, was shot along with President Kennedy. So he announced a nine-month anniversary. Everybody's scratching their heads. Thank you very much. And then he leaves. And by that time, Fannie Lou Hamer's testimony was over. However, it backfired on Johnson because it became a story that she had been taken off television and in the news that night and for, for days afterwards, they replayed her testimony. I was carried to the county jail and put in the booking room. They left some of the people in the booking room and began to place us in sale. She had Mississippi in her bones. Martin Luther King or the SNCC field secretaries, uh, they couldn't do what Fannie Lou Hamer did. They couldn't be a sharecropper and express what it meant, right? And that's what Fannie Lou Hamer um, did. And it wasn't too long before three white men came to my cell. One of these men was the State Highway Patrol. He said, we're going to make you wish you were dead. I was carried out... I was in Mississippi watching it on television with local people. This was a transformative uh, moment for the folks in that room. This was the first time that they ever had seen one of their own, a black Mississippian who they all knew, first of all, on television. Secondly, um, standing up for their rights. I began to scream and one white man got up and began to beat me in my head and tell me to hush. You listen to Mrs. Hamer and you're absolutely convinced that there's absolutely no justification for seating this all-white delegation. And if the Freedom Democratic Party is not seated now, I question America. Is this America, the land of the free and the home of the brave, where we have to speak with our telephones off of the hook because our lives be threatened daily because we want to live as decent human beings in America? Thank you. 
That testimony offered in public session last Saturday, we are told, had the greatest impact on the women members of the Credentials Committee, and it is from among them that a sufficient number has been found to make a minority report possible. The Freedom Democratic Party has done everything in its power, as I listen to the testimony, to abide by the laws and rules of Mississippi. I think they ought to be seated in this convention. I think they represent about 50% of the population of Mississippi, all the Negroes in Mississippi who are excluded from voting and participation in the regular Democratic Party. And I think certainly they're entitled to representation. There was a lot of sympathy for uh, seating this Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. But once you see that Lyndon Johnson has shut down Mrs. Hamer during her live testimony, and you can't help but wonder what else is he going to do? Well, this, this was quite a morality play, really. Uh, and uh, in uh, Jackson, uh, we were uh, watching our heroes uh, as they uh, uh, got on uh, national uh, TV, and we thought for a while there was a good chance that th that they would be uh, seated. But uh, LBJ really did have uh, a lot of uh, uh, tricks up his sleeve, and as it turned out, they offered the Freedom Democrats uh, two seats instead of the 68 that the all-white delegation would uh, would get, and there was. Uh, as, as you can imagine, great uh, disappointment when they uh, thought that they had a, a chance finally of uh, showing the nation uh, uh, what true democracy might uh, look like. Uh, they rejected that offer, and uh, so uh, they were uh, on their way back to uh, Mississippi because there were uh, there was still important work to be, to be done, and uh, but really the, uh, the the Freedom Democrats had had not failed. Uh, demonstrated that by bringing in large uh, numbers of people willing to face resistance and gain a, a nationwide audience uh, a support and and sympathy, it's my belief that. Uh, Freedom Summer set the stage for what would happen seven months later in Selma, Alabama. It was those same organizations uh, that I mentioned uh, and uh, names that are still familiar today. Congressman Julian Bond, uh, Mayor Andrew Young, Congressman John Lewis, Congresswoman uh, Eleanor Holmes Nelson. and. Uh, after the confrontation uh, in Selma, uh, the uh, mood of the nation had finally reached the point where Congress passed a true uh, Voting Rights Act. It was signed into law in August of 65. Uh, Johnson signed the law, and by the end of uh, that year, 60% of uh, black citizens in Mississippi uh, were registered voters. And even today, Mississippi has more black elected officials than any other state. Um, I learned only five years ago that along with the uh, states in the South that had these atrocious voting records, there were a few other places across the country, and one of them was Monterey County, my home county, because of its uh, a poor record of uh, Latino uh, voting access. Uh, and how come 40 years went by before I <laughs> learned that? Maybe some guy from Mississippi would come to Salinas and talk to us about it. <laughs> now, let's fast forward to 2015. Last year, the Supreme Court ruled that the Voting Rights Act no longer reflected the changes that had taken place in the last 50 years. Five justices 
invalidated the section that required the seven states with the worst voting records that would require them to get pre-clearance from the Justice Department before they could make changes, like eliminating voting places uh, near uh, minority neighborhoods or cutting back on voting hours. And so the court took this step to really gut the Voting Rights Act, even though Congress had reauthorized <coughs> this act in 2006, signed by President George Bush. Now we're going to have to wait again for Congress to write a new Voting Rights uh, Act. There are organizations like the League of Women Voters of the United States, uh, the Southern Poverty Law Center, and I'd encourage you to check these out on the web and contact our representatives. And also right here at uh, Stanford, we have the National Archives for the uh, Martin Luther uh, King Center. The lives that were lost in Selma and in uh, uh, Freedom Summer uh, ought to give uh, all of us the impetus to see to it that this uh, act is reauthorized and keep people voting. <clears throat> Now, uh, I don't know if any of you have had a chance to look at uh, my uh, quiz questions, but uh, if, if you want to pull that out, I'll just quickly give you the, uh, the answers and uh, see uh, how, how, uh, how you might do. So the first one, and these are all kind of, you know, one is not like the others. And so the, the answer for one is D, Lyndon Johnson. Uh, the, the others are all Republicans uh, who were essential in getting uh, civil rights uh, legislation through Congress and the courts. Uh, number two is uh, perhaps a, a trick question. The answer is D, Viola Lyutsu. Uh, she lost her life in Selma, Alabama. The others uh, all uh, were killed in uh, Mississippi. Many lives uh, lost just in the uh, year that uh, all this took place. Uh, then uh, three, uh, the, the answer is uh, B, uh, unions. The, all those others, convict leasing and uh, sharecropping, were just methods that were used to get people uh, to continue uh, working in the cotton industry under more, very unfavorable work conditions. And then uh, four is uh, C, uh, motor voter is the only method there that actually encouraged uh, people to be able to uh, register uh, to uh, vote. All the rest are suppression and uh, really uh, what they're doing now uh, with, with the uh, Voting Rights Act so inhibited is bringing back uh, techniques, uh, subtle ones. Somebody described it as a hydra. You cut off one piece and the legis state legislature comes up with some other way to discourage uh, voting. So uh, before we get to questions, I want to uh, be sure to thank uh, uh, Chris Logan and Andrew Mellows for uh, such essential help to me in making this presentation. Uh, I uh, have uh, books and uh, the uh, PBS video that I'm very willing to loan. I've got a sign-up sheet here and we'll figure out who's interested in, uh, in what.